Hey guys, we got another great video for you today. We have our buddy from Sarbometra on here, and we're gonna do a care video of some rare animals, so stay tuned. Yeah. Muffed it anyway. All right guys, so like I said in the intro, we have a great video where our buddy Matthew Most from Sarbometra He's gonna to talk to us about the care of some pretty rare animals, Vietnamese Mandarin rat snakes. They're pretty cool, they're very beautiful, and they can be a little tricky, so he's gonna show us a care video, and you guys can check that out. Make sure you hit the like button and subscribe to us. It really helps us out. So Matt, what do you got going for hey us? Hey guys, thanks for joining us for our second episode of this series of care of unusual colubrids as well as Asiatic rat snakes in the hobby. Um, I'm joined again by Maggie, and Maggie, I'm gonna let her decide what we're gonna talk about this episode. Maggie, what do you wanna talk about? Mandarin rat snakes. What is that? Mandarin rat snakes. Yes, are you excited? Mm-hmm. Real enthused. Got it. Well, guys, you know, from some of the messages we got over the past week, we got a lot of questions related to where do I find information, how do you find information on some of these species. One of the biggest assets, I think, for a lot of these animals, you know, we talk about natural history, um, but also locality. In my opinion, locality of animals really helps when we're looking at weather.com or looking at distribution patterns of how temperatures change throughout the years. Um, month-to-month -month cycle, rain cycles, cooling patterns, and one of the things that really comes into importance out of it is Google Scholar too as well, but also if you're going to be doing anything with Asian rat snakes, I highly recommend Kloss's books. The two books that I would recommend are The Monograph of Laffey and Old World Rat Snake. These are two of what I would consider the Bible for keeping Asian rat snake species. The Old World Rat Snakes book, um, this was just released um, just prior, well, just right around the time that Klaus had passed away. And the monograph of Alafe has been around for a while, but between these two books, you'll be able to find out a lot of the natural history as well as other resources identifying different articles, papers that have been actually published with regards to both of these um, distributions of Alafe, um, talking about Mandarin rat snakes, the Porphyracea complex. They're, they're just a very highly regarded publication for anything related to these species. Uh, so within our collection, we keep a couple of different localities, but primarily Vietnamese locality mandarin rat snakes. Within that, specifically, we have been selectively breeding for the best high yellow animals, as well as exanthics, and also some aberrant patterns too as well. Um, over the next couple of years, we really hope to bring some of these new um, patterns, as well as color variations to the market. Um, at present, you know, the demand has been very high and we haven't been able to provide it with everyone, but we have been able to at least bring some of these different animals to the hobby for those selective keepers. Um, we do keep a couple of Chinese localities, um, but not as much as what we used to. If you look back at Kloss's books, you'll be able to actually distinguish and look at those in terms of um, how each one of those localities is presented. Unfortunately, over the past couple of years, when we start to think about locality and how localities are brought in, um, unfortunately, the market has shifted and the market has actually wanted and dictated a lot of people to actually identify locality with animals, which has also misrepresented some of the animals in the hobby. Um, with that being said, let's pull out some animals and start showing off some things, right? Cool. All right. So, let's talk about one of the most highly sought after Vietnamese Mandarin rat snake. One of the most highly sought after Mandarin rat snakes are these high yellow animals. Um, 
we've seen just such a high interest in terms of the interest on them because of their natural beauty as well as they're so different from anything else available on the market at this point in time. Um, some people are probably wondering too why I use a hook. Um, when I was in grad school I did a lot of work with venomous reptiles and one of the things I never wanted to do was get too comfortable with working with venomous reptiles, especially cobras and elapids. And so I always use a hook to actually grab animals out of a rack system or a tub or a cage. It also doesn't startle the animal as much and the animal comes out a little bit more freer as well as accepting to be handled. With that also, these animals are very placid. Um, they're not very agitated in terms of handling. I've seen some people say, well, my mandarin rat snake always wants to, to bite or, or hiss or strike its tail, things like that. Part of it is, is just the handling and the demeanor of the animals. You don't want to startle them. You want to just pull them out very gently and you want to actually make sure that they are comfortable. Um, with that being said too as well, the one thing sometimes that animals do when they might be startled is they start to musk. You can see all that musk coming off of its tail. Um, it's probably because Maggie was jetting across the back here, which is fine, but you can smell it all over my hand. So if I was to take my hand and go like this to Maggie, she's going to run like crazy. One of the interesting parts with these Vietnamese mandarin rat snakes is these are some of the largest mandarin rat snakes in the hobby. Um, some of these animals can reach a length of over six feet and with that they are a constricting colubrid. Um, this animal is constricting around my wrist right now, uh, wanting to get off and get back into its environment. But if you think about their natural distribution um, from China to Vietnam, these animals are primarily found in the respective leaf litter. Um, so this yellow, black coloration, sometimes gray, it's going to blend into that camouflage specifically of the leaves. Um, within our collection, um, as I mentioned in one of our earlier videos, I have moved a lot of things to the ARS series rack systems. Our adults are kept in the 70s series and our hatchlings are in the hatchling series. We do have some in 50s, 55 series, but one of the biggest things is as these animals actually grow, you want to make sure that they have enough room to actually move because they are fairly active too. Um, so those are some of the high yellow animals that we just kind of depicted and showed off. But one of the other animals we get asked about a lot are the exanthic mandarins. So this is actually a female that had laid eggs the other week and she's actually going back into shed. Um, but these animals are a recessive trait where they hatch out yellow and over the time that they mature they actually use lose that yellow coloration become a white animal and depending on some of the different other traits inside of these species um, they'll either get a little bit more white they'll get more red they'll get darker black too as well um, We've seen that across the board with some of our animals in the collection. This is another one that we have here. And this male has a lot more white. Um, each one of these animals specifically, you know, as, as they mature, we've been kind of line breeding as well as selectively breeding for some of the best colorations to represent each one of these traits. But the exanthic morph is kind of interesting itself because it was actually found um, to be recessive from two wild caught animals that were collected by Stefan Moller. And after breeding those two normally colored animals, he hatched out some yellow animals that lost all of their yellow coloration. Um, they 
looked very similar to this where you had a lot of white, dark black, um, very little red um, with a little tint of red. But within that aspect, you know, we found that it was a recessive trait. Um, these are still very uncommon in the hobby itself. A few people have been breeding them here in the United States. A few people have been breeding them overseas too as well. Um, it's a very unusual trait just because it's not the typical exanthic aspect that we think about in the hobby because these animals do hatch out yellow and then lose all of that coloration. Some of the other things that we are working with presently are some aberrant phase animals and some of these animals are actually just getting ready to to shed as well as to lay eggs for us. So this is an aberrant Vietnamese locality mandarin rat snake. Um, you can look at that pattern and just re you're seeing just wild coloration coming in. We're seeing a lot of that um, diamond circular pattern starting to disappear. This male is actually in shed right now, which we can see from the opaque pattern as well as coloration of the animal. And below him is actually a female that is just getting ready to go into pre-lay shed. Um, this animal has a perfect stripe going from the actual back of the head all the way to the end of the tail. And we're really excited again to breed this animal. Last year we held back every one of her offspring as well as the males um, just to see how they would turn out as well as see what was kind of going on with the animals. And we're probably gonna do that again this year too as well, but it's very fun to actually do some of this stuff just because, you know, looking at these traits, trying to selectively breed for these different genetic traits is really what the hobby is about. We wanna actually breed for the best animals. We wanna bring things new to the hobby and we wanna kind of push the hobby to the limits. So one other animal that I'm gonna bring out related to the Vietnamese mandarin rat snakes is actually one of our largest males. This animal came from one of my good friends, uh, Jasper, overseas. And Jasper had sent it to me because we were looking for some of the largest Vietnamese mandarin rat snakes that we could actually acquire. Um, I'm about five foot 11, and if I can get this animal to cooperate, I can actually imitate Jasper's picture that he did several years ago of this animal holding it straight up and hopefully not get struck at because the animal is right on my thumb but this animal has been just a gentle giant um, he loves medium rats and I mean just in terms of its coloration its pattern this is a very typical um, Hong Valley Sapa locality from Vietnam. Um, very intrinsic animal. Um, loves to come out, loves to be handled, but he also has a very strong feeding response. So he um, sometimes makes an interesting animal when it comes to feeding day because he'll come charging out of his cage looking for his medium rat. Um, but I'm gonna put him back and I'm going to show some of our other animals that I thought might be of interest to as well. So talking about the Vietnamese rat snakes as well as the exanthic morphs, one of the common questions that comes up is like, well, what a heck exanthic mandarins look like? Well, I'm going to pull one of those out so you can see. There appears to be an aspect of a visual heck. These animals specifically have a much lighter background coloration. Um, very white in coloration, but the saddles remain that real deep yellow. Um, it, it's very interesting to see how some of this actually transpires. Um, we've often wondered, you know, are there other things going on with this exanthic morph just purely because We've seen different line traits as well as different things actually pop up. Um, and, and it's curious to see how things will evolve over this. 
Um, we have what I would consider three different lines of Xanthic, and I say that purely because all three of them look very differently. Um, some of them have more white, some of them have more red, some of them have a little bit deeper, darker black, red coloration. So just, you know, what I mentioned before, this is a hobby and realistically we should be selectively breeding for the best traits. I think the best way to actually preserve those lines as well as see what comes out of it is breeding those specific animals together to see what we do get. Um, that being said, I'm going to pull out some of the Chinese animals so we can actually talk about those a little bit too. So a lot of people ask, you know, in terms of care of mandarins, you know, when we look at mandarin's care and some of the different setups that I showed you, I keep everything as an adult on cypress mulch. I do that purely because the humidity requirements of the animals, that 50 to 60 percent humidity, and again, it's not saturated cypress mulch, it's moist, an occasional spraying across the cage helps very much, but also that temperature gradient inside these tubs ranges from about 70 to 76 degrees. Now, talking about the Vietnamese locality animals, these animals breed later in the season. We're talking about a breeding season of starting um, late April, May, June, in terms of cycling some of these animals. Um, these animals are just now starting to lay eggs, so we won't even be hatching out some of these animals until September, October. And with that being said, we get a lot of inquiries about hey, what's your availability on mandarins, and a lot of it is basically probably not until the following year. Um, and we do that purely because we want to make sure that those animals are feeding properly before we sell them. A lot of the things specifically even with the Chinese variety localities is these animals are going to be hatching right now, typically that June, July, August month time frame. And most of these animals require a short hibernation period. Um, that short cooling period will actually trigger their feeding response. We do keep the hatchlings in six quart tubs. Um, I try to keep things a little bit simple for hatchlings. I keep them on a paper towel with a water bottle, a water bowl, and I do keep it relatively moist. And one of the things with it, like I said, most of these animals, when they're smaller, they'll want and prefer live pinky mice. And they're going to want live pinky mice because of the fact that they are nest raiders. Um, that being said, if you can't feed live pinky mice, one of the things that I would highly recommend is washing your pinky mice. Um, getting your frozen thawed pinky mice, washing them with um, soap and water, basically popping a couple of frozen thawed pinky mice in a little deli and putting some soap in there and letting cold water basically come across. The reason why I say that is purely because the urine smell may be very high on the frozen thawed rodent itself and that might actually be pushing the animal away from feeding. But that's just kind of a trick for getting some of these younger mandarin rat snakes to feed. Um, again, I keep these animals in this tub as well as rack system set at 70 to 75 as a heat gradient. And when we look at this specific locality, this is a Zhejiang locality mandarin rat snake from China. One of the interesting things about some of these Chinese locality mandarin rat snakes is we're going to see differences on the dorsal pattern diamonds. Um, some of the common uh, localities that you're going to see in the hobby are Hunan, Sichuan, and the Zhejiang are still very, very new to the hobby itself. The Sichuan have the largest, most yellow circular diamonds on the actual dorsal pattern. The Hunans are going to be the smallest of all the localities. Um, they're also going to have the most vibrant black, deep dark black 
on their actual dorsal diamonds, and these Jejings are going to have the smallest diamonds. So, in terms of showing some of the pattern, we'll kind of bring that up so you can see how small that is. Um, you can see some of the smaller diamonds, but also, I mean, like I said, if you notice the animal, it's not striking. You want to be just very slow moving um, and entertaining the actual natural characteristics and um, reading the animal appropriately. So here's another Chinese locality, Mandarin Rat, and you can tell just in terms of the animal itself, those diamonds are not as small as what the other animal presented. Um, you know, when looking at these localities and different traits, there's a number of different characteristics, and I would recommend looking at Kloss's book for a lot of this information. He really takes a lot of descriptions as well as photo depictions of each one of these localities to present that to the keeper. Um, but again, you know, just for common care, uh, courtesy of these animals, they are a secretive animal. Um, you do want to provide them with a nice gradient in terms of temperature. They do require to be hibernated over the winter to actually produce sperm as well as follicles for breeding season. Uh, the Chinese locality of this species breeds in the early spring, similar to most of our other colubrids, and the Vietnamese locality animal breeds later in the season. Um, if you guys have any questions related to Mandarin rat snakes, don't hesitate to shoot me a message on Sarpometra or email me at matt at sarpometra.com. More than happy to answer any questions. Um, I would recommend, like I said, looking at Klaus's book for a lot of information related to these localities as well as distributions. And again, thanks Ryan and Ben for having us for this video care series. Thanks guys. Thank you so much for watching guys. I hope you got some really good information on these uh, amazing and rare species. Um, if you liked the video, give it a thumbs up. I know you liked it. If you didn't like it, get out of here. Comment down below, let us know what other species you want uh, care videos on, and subscribe. And subscribe. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> Bye. <laughs>